Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. We are continuing our Bible study in the book of Deuteronomy. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So we're going to go through verse by verse and then study more deeply into each verse as we do it. But before we do that, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. So I invite you to pray with me. Our dear Father in heaven, we come before you and thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for the work you're doing in this world to prepare a people to stand in the last days. Uh, we know the trials are going to come very soon. We can see signs all around and we just want to we want to be ready. And at the same time, we want to encourage and help as many people to be ready as uh, in addition. So we ask that you would use us in your work. We know that the whole Christian uh, faith was started with just a group of 12 disciples. And we're, we're not a big group here, but we know that you could do amazing things through us. So we just pray that you would maximize our uh, benefit in this world so that we can be better ourselves and be more effective in sharing the gospel with others. We pray for guidance as we open your word tonight. We claim the promise where, that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, there he is in the midst, and also that you'll give us your spirit to guide us into all truth. Uh, so we're claiming those promises, thanking you so much for them, and we ask for your guidance and your blessing upon this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So we're still in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Um, we'll go ahead and go over this one more time, at least. Because we did, we missed some things last time. So, who would like to start with verse one? Are we going to read three verses at a time? Yes, that would be great. Okay, I guess I could start. So. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, "Here, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, I moved it earlier. Yeah." I'm actually reading from my Bible anyway. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. And the, the Lord, our, our God, made a covenant with us in Horeb. And the Lord made not the covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. Okay. Okay. Lonnie's going to read. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh -oh. <clears throat> the Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time. I shew you and the word of the Lord, <clears throat> for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went out up unto the mount, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thank you. Verses 7 through 9. I can do those. Thank you. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image, for that is in the earth beneath, or in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them for i the lord god am a jealous god visiting the iniquities of the father upon the children and to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me thank you verses 10 through 12 anyone you want to do 10 through 12 ainsley yeah do 10 through ainsley will Thank you. and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. 
Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Thank you. 13 to 15, anyone? Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, or, or, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Thank you. Verses well, 18. Okay. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee that they, oh, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse Thank 17, you. thou shalt not kill, neither shall, now verse 18, neither shall thou commit adultery. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I can do the next. Yeah, Lonnie could do the next. Right. Neither shall thou kill, neither shall thou uh, bear false witnesses against thy neighbor, uh, neither shall thou uh, desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shall thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his man servant, or his maid servant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. All right, thank you. And then would somebody like to read? 22 through 24. Mm -hmm. I'll take that one. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out in the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thickness, thick darkness with a great voice. And he added no more. He wrote them in on two tables of <clears throat> excuse me, stone and delivered them unto me. And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness where the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? God, or sorry, go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee and we will hear it and do it. 28 to 30. Ainsley, you want to do 28 to 30? 28 to 30. Okay. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when he spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Uh, oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Go say to them, get you into your tents again. All right. Thank you very much. Three more verses. 31 to 33. Well, I don't think. 
Okay, thanks. But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you that ye may live, that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We got through the chapter again. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what we see here is a reiteration of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the first time, only other time, I believe, they're, they're mm -hmm. listed in this detail is found in Exodus chapter 20. Um, I do find it interesting that there is a difference with these Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments listed in Exodus chapter 20. Does anybody know what the significant differences are? Or, or difference? Uh, the explanation of the Sabbath? The explanation of the Sabbath, exactly. So, yeah, that's what I was well, thinking. So what's different about the explanation of the, sa of the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. One's creation and one's redemption or, or deliverance. Uh, uh, good point. <laughs> deliverance. Yes. deliverance, which is a sign of redemption. So exactly, the, the Ten Commandments listed here and the reason for the Sabbath given is it says uh, in verse 15, remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day, uh, to keep the Sabbath day. Anyway, comparing that to Exodus chapter 20, and we can see that the difference. Um, so in Exodus 20, it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So that's really the only difference, or the only significant difference, is in Exodus 20, it says he created the world in six days. That's why he blessed the Sabbath day. Now, um, do you think both accounts are correct? Yes, both accounts are correct. I would agree. Um, is it possible that he said the whole, both statements? Yeah. Initially. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, um, one of them tells you it was because you're delivered and the other one says you're, uh, the world was created in seven days or six days, sorry. And you also were created within that six-day period. So it's talking about our creation. And in Deuteronomy, it's talking about our redemption, how we were saved from peril. Anyway, that's one significant difference. You know, there's actually another difference that I noticed. There's, there may be some that you notice as well, but another one is in verse 21, where it says, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Do you notice anything different about that commandment? We'll just compare it back to Exodus. Well, 20. they're not using the word covet, right? They're using the word desire, maybe? Yes. that That's the, the only thing that I'm seeing in that. Uh, so verse 17, Exodus 20 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor. So very similar wording. Um, but in English, at least, it says, Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, and so on. So 
but no, notice the word covet is the same in both places. It's 2530. 2530. Uh, we can look up the word here, the, the Hebrew word. It means most often the word was translated desire. Kodifiar. It was only, only used 21 times in the Bible, and the most often times, 11 times, it was translated desire. Four times it was translated covet. Anyway, so it means to desire, covet, take pleasure in, delight in. To desire, to be desirable, to delight greatly, desire greatly. So that's what the word means. Um, and now I'm curious what it says back in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 521. Okay, if you'll notice, um, the word desire, neither shalt thou desire your neighbor's wife. That word desire is the same word, uh, chamad, which was translated covet. And that's what it's used in Exodus chapter 20. It's used twice in Exodus 20. But notice there's a different word here. It says, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, which was translated covet in Exodus 20. Uh, and then it says, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house. Now that what word is, covet is a different word. What is the 183? It's a different word. Um, now the, the word itself was used 26 times. It's ava. And it was most often translated desire 17 times. And then four times it was translated lust three times long, two times covet. So you get very similar definitions of the word or uses of the word. And it means to desire, incline, covet, wait longingly, wish, sigh, want, be greedy, prefer, to desire, crave, crave food and drink, to desire, long for, lust after, of bodily appetites. So... Linfer can't hear you. Okay, yeah, somehow I got muted. I don't even know how that yeah. happened. So was there a reason that they changed the words or because they're so similar to them, it, it just was the same for them? The good, authors. Good Good point. Um, it, I, I guess the words are so similar that they um, almost mean the same thing. This is The first one is Chamad. Now, remember, Hebrew words go backwards. So the first letter of this word is actually right here. Uh, well, the first part of that, that word is. Yeah, Hebrew yeah. goes back. Looks, mm -hmm. looks like homad. I was trying to learn Hebrew. I learned oh, that okay. it goes backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unique. And then it's more. Oh, go ahead. It's, it's more of a German CH or Greek. CH right there. Oh, that's why okay. they have the K. That's why they have the KH, the dictionary sound. Oh, okay. KH. Uh, come on. Well, you, I guess you'll try to say Ho. Ho mod. Okay. Um, now, this is interesting. So, Uh, this doesn't say it's a verb. It just says it's a primitive root. You, you'd think that it was a verb. So the other word, 183, it says it's a verb. A primitive root. And then see that V there indicates that it's a verb. But the other word, for whatever reason in this dictionary, it does not, it does not list any letter there. So it doesn't even say whether it's a verb, a noun, or whatever. But we actually know it's a verb because of this number after it. Whenever there's this number in, in this program, it, it indicates that it's a verb because only verbs have those numbers. Uh, this says it's qual and imperfect. But anyway, so the, there are different Hebrew words that use there in that verse. Maybe that's why it translated them differently. One was translated desire, the other was translated covet. 
whereas in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, they're both translated covet, but interestingly, the Hebrew word that was used was the same one that was translated desire in this verse. So there are two different Hebrew words in this verse, whereas in Exodus 20, there's only uh, one word used in both places. Anyway, that's about the only differences I've noticed in these two um, chapters. There, I'm sure there's others, but... Any comments on the Ten Commandments here? Well, Lonnie wanted to say something. Okay, go what ahead. The difference between statutes and judgment? Good question. <laughs> so... We can just do a, a quick search on those things. So statutes, 2706, it's used 127 times. Um, it was translated statute 87 times. So the most often use of the word was statute. Um, it was also translated ordinance and decree, do, law, Portion, bounds, custom, appointed, commandments. It says a statute, ordinance, limit, something prescribed, do, prescribed task, prescribed portion, an action prescribed for oneself, resolved, prescribed do, prescribed limit, boundary, an enactment, a decree, ordinance, a specific decree, a law in general, Enactments, statutes, conditions, enactments, decrees, and then it says civil enactments prescribed by God. Okay, so those, that's, it's Chog, or ch Coke, Coke, I don't know how you'd say that exactly. Coke. 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 Okay. I'll take your word for it. Um. Anyway, so that's statutes, and judgments is a different Hebrew word. It's mish, mishpat, and it means it, it was used a total of 421 times, and 296 times it was translated judgment, 38 times it was manner, and then right, 18 times, cause, ordinance, uh, lawful, order, worthy, Fashion, custom, discretion, law. Okay, it says the definition is judgment, justice, ordinance. Judgment, an act of deciding a case, place, court, seat of judgment, a process, procedure, litigation before judges, a case or a cause presented for judgment, a sentence, a decision of judgment, execution of judgment, time of judgment, Justice, right, rectitude, rectitude, attributes of God or man. It says ordinance, decision in law, right, privilege, due, legal, proper fitting, measures, fitness, custom, custom and manner. So that's the definitions given in the dictionary for those two words. Well, one thing it would probably be good to do is find out how this word is used other places. So the first one is statutes. The very first time this word is found is Genesis 47, 22. Uh, just put that in the notes here, I suppose. Uh, it says, only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priest had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their lands. Anyway, that's... Uh, talking about the priests they didn't have to they didn't have to sell their lands when the famine got really bad uh, because they were given a portion of food from the from the pharaoh and that word is portion so that's the same as statutes so i guess it, it was a law prescribed um, for the priests that they could have food from pharaoh's food stores and then also verse 26 of the same chapter joseph made it a law over the land of egypt unto this day that pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests only 
which became not pharaohs. So that was a law. Um, this was a law of Joseph in this particular case, that the priests didn't have to lose their land. So those are the first two times it's used is Genesis 47. And then the next time we find it is Exodus 5, 14. The officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, wherefore have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? So you remember the story here, uh, talking about the taskmasters that were punishing the, the Jews, telling them they had to make more bricks and they had to also go get their own straw because it wasn't provided yeah. for and then they were beaten for not making more, making enough bricks. And it's called a task here. You didn't do your task. That's a um, ordinance, isn't that, isn't that what, it, or no, statute. So that's a statute, right? The chalk or coke statute. So there was a, a law written for them to make so many bricks and they didn't do it. So they got in trouble for it. Next time we find it is in Exodus 12, verse 24. Let me write these notes down. So the last one is Exodus 5, 14. Exodus 5 and verse 14. And then we find it in Exodus 12, 24. Anybody know what Exodus 12 is about? Exodus 12 is about the Passover, the first Passover. Uh, when, oh. the, when the uh, destroying angel went over the city and killed the firstborn, except for the houses, he would pass over the houses that had put the blood of the, the lamb on their doorposts. The Passover lamb uh, was killed and the blood was taken and it was put on the doorposts and whoever had the, the blood on their doorposts, the destroying angel would skip that house and would not kill the firstborn. Mm -hmm. Anyway, how, go ahead. Go how, ahead. How, how important obedience is. Yeah, for sure. When they were told to do that, they couldn't say, oh, why should we do that? Why would we take this little lamb and do that? You know, uh, <laughs> they had to obey. Just do That's it. True. Do what God told them to do. Yeah, there's there's several other examples of that where God gave instruction and it had to be kept exactly as said. For example, when the when the serpent, there was a bunch of snakes that were biting the Israelites because they were they had been murmuring, and so the serpents came through and they were biting the children of Israel. And then God told Moses to make a a serpent, a brazen serpent made out of brass and put on a staff. And then they were to look at the staff and live. And whoever looked at the staff, the serpent on the staff, would mm -hmm. live. The, would heal. Yeah, the serpent's bite would not hurt them. So that was very specific instruction. It seemed like not that important. You know, how is looking at a brass serpent going to help you? But it evidently did. Uh, so I, there's nothing intrinsic, there's no intrinsic value in the the brazen serpent, but it was in the obedience to God's command. When God told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it seemed like a really simple and significant thing. And whether they ate it or not, it didn't seem that important, mm -hmm. other than the fact that it was a direct violation of God's instruction. And so then, yeah, it's huge. I don't think we can fathom how huge of a situation it is when you disobey God and how important it is to obey in every detail. Anyway, getting back to um, the Passover in Exodus 20, verse 24, it says, you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Okay, so there's an ordinance that is to be for thee and thy sons forever. 
that's similar to where it says for your generations, throughout your generations. Have you ever heard that wording? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have. Mm -hmm. We'll probably see some of those as we're looking through these. So anyway, that's the, for the, the second time in Exodus we find it. Um, the first one, this is the first time in Exodus where it's prescribed by God, an ordinance that God gave. And this was an ordinance of the Passover. And then it says in Exodus 15, 25, uh, this is a interesting. He cried unto the Lord. So the context of this, uh, Rita's trying to get in. So let her in. So the context of this is the people murmured against the Lord because the, the water, they had water that was uh, bitter. Bitter, that's what Mara, the waters of Mara were bitter. And that's why they called it Mara. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So there's an ordinance that he made. What, what was the ordinance in this case? Uh, mishvat, and then uh, chok. Chok is the, the word that we're looking at. Anyway, he made the statute for them. And he said, if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight, will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals thee. Anyway, so that was the ordinance. I guess this is the ordinance he's talking about that he established that if you obey his voice you don't have any diseases on you that's a pretty good deal okay. so anyway continuing um it says, when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. So we're looking at statutes and judgments. Statutes so far, um, it's translated ordinances. I shall teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Okay, now this is an interesting one. So, so statutes and ordinances are kind of the same thing? Interchangeable, it seems. I mean, it was translated interchangeably. Mm -hmm. So look at this one. This is found in Exodus 29, verse 27. Does anybody want to read that? We're, we'll probably read a couple of verses here. Um, yeah, just verses 27 uh 26 through 28 would somebody like to read those verses for us exodus 29 26 to 28 i'll take yeah, it oh, oh go sorry. ahead no 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 go ahead okay uh and thou shalt take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wait and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thy part. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved, and which is heaved up of the ram of the consecration, even of that which is for Aaron, and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons by statute forever from the children of Israel. For it is an heave offering, and it shall be an heave offering from the children of Israel or the sacrifice of their peace. Offerings, even their heave offering unto the Lord. All right. 
So question here is a statute. Um, and what is the statute in this place? Any comments? We're in Exodus 29, 26 to 28. And welcome, Rita. Glad you're here. Thank you. Sorry, I'm so late. No problem. Um, a heap. What is a, a heap offering is what now? Sorry. Okay. Um, let's just check that out really quick. It's a type of an animal sacrifice. That much is sure. Mm -hmm. But there's okay. a wave offering and a heave offering. So the heave mm -hmm. offering, um, interesting, it just says contribution, offering, a heave offering, any offering, an offering to God. Uh, mm -hmm. So a gift, an oblation. And then there's, there's the heave offering and the wave offering. So we'll look at the wave offering now. It's a little different word. And it means wave offering, swinging or waving. They actually waved uh, certain sacrifices. They waved around um, before the Lord. Okay. The heave Sorry. offering, I think it said the shoulder. So I'm I'm thinking that was an animal sacrifice. Oh yeah, it says the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved. Oh. Uh, thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved and which is heaved of the ram of the consecration. Um, heaved up. So that word is to lift or hold, to exalt, to rise. So I, I guess they're both the heave offering is lifted up and the wave offering is waved. So here it says the wave offering is waved, uh, to wave, to shake, to move to and fro. Okay, so one is held up, the other is held up and sh shook around. So it seems a little odd, but that's what they were. But anyway, the, the thing that's significant that we should notice, uh, at least one thing, is that this is a statute forever. How long is forever? A long time. Okay. Yeah, but a very long time. <laughs> okay, a statute but not, is... But not eternity. Is... Oh. Okay, no, not eternity. Can something that's forever, according to this context be temporary yes uh-huh yes absolutely so the the rule was it was a statute that's forever statute forever but it was a statute that was temporary it seems weird to make such a statement but we know that it was temporary for several reasons one this statute was for what the priest was to do with the sacrifice after they killed an animal they were to do something with it either wave it or or hold it up and this was a statute forever for the children of aaron aaron and his sons uh that was a statute forever uh, for it's a heave offering it should be a heave offering from the children of israel a sacrifice of their peace offering their heave offering unto the Lord. Anyway, that was a statute forever. So we learn here that a statute forever can refer to something that is temporary. Correct? Now, Correct. Yeah. as far Correct. as... Okay, watch this. Um, there's made of necessity... Um, in Hebrews chapter 7. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12. Would anybody like to read that? Yeah, I could read it. Okay. For the priesthood being changed, there is made 
a necessity, a change also of the law. Okay, so what is this talking about? It's in Hebrews chapter 7, if you're familiar with that chapter. Hebrews 7 is a explanation of Melchizedek, the priesthood of Melchizedek in contrast to the Levitical priesthood and pointing out that Melchizedek's priesthood was better, was superior to the Levitical priesthood. Um, he even says that Levi paid tithes uh, verse 9, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. He was talking about Abraham giving tithe to Melchizedek, and then he's saying, well, Levi, since he was in the loins of Abraham, he paid tithes. And then he's pointing out that uh, Melchizedek is better, is a better priesthood than the Levitical priesthood. And he said also that um, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And then he says the less is blessed of the better. Uh, in verse 6, he whose descent, descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So what he's saying is Melchizedek was better than the Levitical priesthood. Anyway, so the, the key verse, though, that I wanted to look at was that the priesthood being changed... Was the Levit Levitical priesthood ever designed to last forever? For without end, yeah. to be more precise? Yeah. No, it was, it was not designed and never was designed to bring perfection. It wasn't designed to last forever. Um, watch this one. So this is also in Hebrews chapter 9. Just two chapters later. Uh, anybody want to read verses 8 through 10? Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. Yeah, I can. Okay. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was yet not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Okay. So notice it talks about carnal ordinances, diverse washings and meats and drinks. It says these were imposed on them until the time of Reformation. And it also says that it was for the time then present. So when Paul was writing this, was the time still present? I, I would say I that would it was. Not, so. I would what's think that? So. I would think so, right? Um, I would say no. Oh, you think? Say, okay. Well, well, oh, when, okay. okay. When Maybe Paul I'm is, not When Paul is writing it, it says, which was, was past tense, a figure for the time then present. Yeah, that's kind of odd. I mean, it's kind of hard to understand. <laughs> Yeah, because it is. It was your past tense, and then he's talking about present. Uh, well, he says then present. So then is past. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then, so it was present for them then. It was it was current and up to date for them at that time, but it was not uh -huh. for their time. It was for mm -hmm. their time, not for our time. That's what I'm getting from it anyway. 
Uh huh. And yeah, that, it, that's that's a good question to ask. What is current and what's not current as far as festivals, feasts? Yeah, we've been studying that for a while. Right. And here it says it was imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So this the time is not present anymore. Uh, it was imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So what I understand that means until Christ's time when he sets Reformation, meaning to um, let's look at that word really quick. It's only used once in the whole Bible. It says in a physical sense, a making straight, restoring to its natural and normal condition something which in some way protrudes or has got out of line as broken or misshapen limbs of acts and institutions, reformation. So literally re reformation till the time of reformation where things would be reformed, uh, made right. Anyway, but it is called ordinances. Now, remember, we already saw that uh, statutes were sometimes called ordinances. Uh, it translated uh -huh. out. So we can go back to our previous search. Um, here it is, the statutes. So, we just read in Exodus 29 about the statute that was forever for Aaron and his children to eat the uh, the sacrifice of the heave offering. They were to eat it. That was a statute forever or an ordinance forever. It was a law, this particular type of law that was to last forever. Although the forever is not without end. So this is an example of a statute forever that didn't mean without end. We know that it doesn't mean without end because number one, the sacrifice and offerings were ceased when, when Christ died. It says in Daniel chapter seven, uh, verse, what is that, 26? Uh, where is that? Oh, sorry, it's not Daniel 7. No wonder. Daniel 9. Daniel 9. Uh, it says that the sacrifice and offerings will cease in verse 27. So Daniel 9, 27 says that when Christ comes in the midst of the week, and are you? I think we're all familiar with this. It's talking about yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the last week, because it says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And then it says there's going to be 62 and then seven weeks, and then there's a last week. 62 and seven is 69, and then there's one week left. It's the 70th week. And in the midst of the 70th week, and these weeks are weeks of years. Uh, that's the only thing that fits in this context, because he says from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem um, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So from the restoring of the, the law to restore and build Jerusalem from Babylon's time, uh, when that was to be rebuilt, that, that happened in 457 BC is when that commandment, that final commandment went forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And then it says from that time, so from 457 BC until Messiah the Prince, there's going to be 69 weeks. Now, if you multiply that out, 69 times 7. Does anybody know that math in their head? Well, it'd be 490 years minus because 490 would be uh, 70 weeks times seven 70 times seven be 490 mm -hmm. and then you subtract the last seven the last week so the last seven days or seven years in this case you would have 483 
So there's 483 years from the time of the commandment, of the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there's going to be 483 years. Now, did mm -hmm. that happen? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can trace yes. it from history. It was from 457 BC, 483 years later, brings you to the time of uh, the anointing of Messiah, the Prince. Mm -hmm. It's this is an amazing prophecy. Yeah, and the and the Jewish people have this prophecy. <laughs> That's and true. They didn't, see, they didn't see the Messiah. That's right. So 483 years brought you to 27 AD when the Messiah was anointed and began his, his public ministry. And then it says in the midst of the week. The last week, because you have 69 weeks and then there's one more to make 70. In the midst of the last week, it says he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So the midst of the week when he uh, causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease, it's in the midst of the week, which is exactly the same time that the Messiah was cut off. Because it's after the 69 weeks that the Messiah would be cut off. It was in that 70th week, in the midst of it actually, when Jesus would die. And when he was cut off, that caused the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. Remember what happened to the temple when Jesus died? The earthly temple on the earth? Yeah, the veil was torn in two. The veil was rent from it top to rent, bottom. Rent in twain from top to bottom. Um, and was that a human that did that? No. No. <laughs> the veil was very thick and yes. very tall. <laughs> very thick and very tall. Um, it's an angel. It was an angel that did that. Why do you think that happened? To show the sacrificial service was ended over. Exactly. But I'll bet they kept on sacrificing animals. Well, what I understand, we know they kept sacrificing animals because you still read about it in the book of Acts. But I, I'm i convinced that that was a wrong thing to do. What I understand is they sewed the, the veil back up and just kept going. Uh-huh. Uh, but Jesus also said, your house is left unto you desolate or empty. That's what the word desolate means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the Holy of Holies is desolate. Or, well, there's no presence there, right? Yes. Um, Jesus said in Luke 13, 35, behold, your house is left desolate unto you desolate and the word desolate uh, understood it means empty let me just double check that erimos it means wilderness desert desolate solitary solitary lonely uninhabited that's the uh, the main thing that i see from that context your house is left unto you uninhabited or empty. That's what I understand the significance was of the, the ripping the veil, tearing the veil from top to bottom to show that that system was ended. Do you think continuing that system was a good idea? No. No, because God showed it, them that it was ended. Yes, I, I agree. I, I don't think what did you say? Disobedience on their part. Yes. It's and it was. Continue. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, we, we see then that there was a law that was changed when Jesus died that caused the, the statutes, at least the ones relating to the sacrifices and the priesthood, at least that was done away with. I would say all the all the rules relating to the sanctuary services were, were ended. Would you agree with that? Yes. 
Because it says that the, the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. We read that in Hebrews chapter 9. So when the priesthood got changed, things had to change. Laws had to change. Statutes had to change. So even statutes forever can change under certain circumstances, right? Anyway, I know I know some people make a big deal when they say, look, it's a statute forever. You better keep doing it. Well, if you're going to follow... What <laughs> what's that? That's what I've heard also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you're going to make that argument, then you really need to go back and start doing the, the animal sacrifices and the sanctuary and get Levitical mm -hmm. priests involved. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that would be... That would be an affront to God, basically, because he already made yeah. it very plain that system is ended. That system mm -hmm. is and so if you go back and do that stuff, which I've heard people say that I, I've talked to people. There's a church just down the road from us. Um, I've talked to some people there. They're, they're Messianic Jews. And they say that the only reason they're not doing sacrifices today, because those are laws that were forever supposed to do it. The only reason they're not doing it today is because the temple has not been built yet. Uh, they're waiting for this temple to be rebuilt over in Jerusalem. And then they said, when that temple is built, we are obligated to go as, as Christians, as believers in the Messiah, we are obligated to go and participate in that sanctuary service. So if you sin, you go and take an animal and have the priest kill it. Take the blood and do whatever he needs to do with it. Anyway, I think that's a dangerous concept. Mm -hmm. But it comes from the idea that a statute is forever. So if forever. there's a Jew living in Oklahoma, uh -huh. once the temple, let's say once the temple is built, and there's a Jew living in Oklahoma, and he sins, he knows he sinned, is he going to have to go over to Israel to sacrifice? Well, that's what I was told here uh, in our local church group. They're expecting that to happen, and they're expecting to migrate over to Israel when that happens. Wow. Just waiting for the temple to be built. And then once it is, they're required, according to them, by this rule right here. It's a statute mm -hmm. forever. See, They feel obligated and required to, that they have to go and participate. It's not even practical. Everybody can't just be doing that. No, that's a good point. We wouldn't fit, right? If every Christian in the world would go there, uh, that's we, true, wouldn't, yeah. we wouldn't fit in the in the area and we wouldn't be able to, and the priesthood would be overwhelmed. They'd have to build a whole bunch of sanctuaries. Well, it's like I always say, God is not the God of confusion. Exactly. So I, I think one thing we can learn for sure is that when it says there's a statute forever, we have to look at the context to determine if this is a statute that has no end. Just because it says statute forever does not mean that it has no end. Correct? Correct. I mean, you can yes. see that. It looks like that is correct. <laughs> You can see that with uh, circumcision, because circumcision is also said to be forever. Um, and yet, now, I remember last week we were in discussion, and there was a brother here that was saying, if God instituted it, you know, it's, a, it's an appointed time that God made, so therefore it's more valuable, more important. Well, look, this rule right here for the priest to eat that particular sacrifice, that was also instituted by God. There's a rule God made, and he says it was a statute forever. So the same same argument um, could be used for that. Just because God instituted a particular thing, it could be that it was for the time then present, that it was mm -hmm. imposed on them until the time of reformation, until things were made right, and until the shadow because it's also called shadows. Shadows are uh, vague representations of the reality. And once the reality comes on the scene, you don't need the shadow anymore. 
Uh, I used to play hide and seek sometimes and I could see if I looked around a corner, there's a shadow of somebody. I would know where they're, that they're there. They're hiding. I could see their shadow. Um, anyway, that when I went around the corner, I would know there's going to be the real person there because I could see the shadow ahead of time. Anyway, shadows are just a vain representation uh, of the reality, but the reality is more important, more valuable, and we should stick with the reality and let go of the shadow when it's time to let go of it. And when the time to let go was, had to be right when Christ died, because it was then when the, the priesthood was changed, there had to be a change of the law, and the shadows were for the time then present. Okay, so here's another one, Exodus 30, 21. So this is talking about the uh, sanctuary, talking about the Levites. It says they had to, we can read 20 and 21. Anybody want to read that? Exodus 30, 20 and 21. Yeah, I guess. I could read it. Okay. When they go onto the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord, so they, so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statue forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So interestingly, there it goes even a little more further in the explanation. It says it's a statute forever, but then it says it shall be to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So it's a generational rule for the Levites. And that only applied to the time then present while the tabernacle services were um, to be in force and to be carried out. But then remember what happened to the, to the tabernacle and Jesus even foretold it. He told his disciples, one stone will not be left on another. Uh-huh. In 70 AD, it was destroyed. In 70 AD, it was destroyed, and it's never been rebuilt. So from 70 AD to now, that's almost 2,000 years. The world has been absent of a sanctuary. Now, do you think if God planned for that service to continue forever without end, that he would allow such a gap? in uh, the services don't you think he'd expect them to already be still carrying on uh-huh there was there was a gap in it you know when the the, the tabernacle was destroyed by uh, king nebuchadnezzar when babylon came and overthrew israel the tabernacle at that time was overthrown as well so there was a time it was 70 years that the tabernacle was without uh, any services and then there was a commander that went to go and re rebuild that tabernacle. Mm -hmm. But it was a short time. You know, God planned for it to continue. So he had it built. He, he even gave a prophecy of it happening and gave a prophecy of the, the king that would be involved in restoring it. He mentioned him by name um, many years before he was born. Uh, anybody remember his name? Cyrus? Cyrus, that's right. Mm -hmm. Cyrus, king of Persia. Yeah, he commanded him, Nehemiah, to go rebuild the tabernacle. Right. So anyway, the, the fact that God didn't let a long gap happen, it was just a short gap while the Israelites were kicked out of their country for their evil and wickedness. And then he planned for it to be restored and for them to come back and build their city or build their, yeah, but rebuild the city and rebuild the tabernacle and continue the services. And that, so that happened. So when Jesus came on the scene, the sanctuary was in process of being used. 
but then it got destroyed again in 70 AD and there's no instruction in the Bible anywhere um, that it was going to be rebuilt. Now, some would argue, wait a minute, what about Ezekiel? What about the sanctuary listed in Ezekiel? Well, it's true that Ezekiel uh, mentions um, sanctuary, but um, look what it says in Ezekiel 43, verse 11. So there's there's detailed instructions for rebuilding of a sanctuary in Ezekiel 43, 11. It doesn't give a time period when it would happen, though. Um, unlike the one that we just read in Daniel, in Daniel, it gave a time period when it would happen. And then when the Messiah would come. But here it says in Ezekiel 43, 11, would anybody like to read that? And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangement, its exists and its entrances, its entire design and all its ordinances, all its forms and all its laws, write it down in their sight so that they may keep the whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. Okay, did you notice a conditional statement in there? It says, connection, did you hear me? Yes. Okay. Keep going in and out all of a sudden. Oh, am I going in and out? Yeah, on your end. I didn't know if you could hear me talking. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, no, I hear you. no, you sound fine. Okay, good. Um, you sound good now. <laughs> okay, well, I moved my this, this rule in Ezekiel 43 11, this instruction to Ezekiel, he says, so in verse 10, even it says, Thou son of man, show the house of the show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinance thereof. So it says the the instruction given here is that if they repent, if they're ashamed of all their doings, if they repent, then they were, Ezekiel was to show them the form of this tabernacle. So it was conditional. Did the Israelites repent in a general way for killing the Son of God? No. 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 No, they're still insistent that Jesus is not the Messiah. The, the leadership, I should say. They're, they still have been rebellious against God. Anyway, I don't believe this tabernacle is ever supposed to be rebuilt. And I'm not saying it won't be rebuilt. The, the Israelites over there, they, they might read some of the verses in Ezekiel and say, oh, we're supposed to build a tabernacle. So they go and build it. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about that, of the Israelites rebuilding the temple. There's a little bit of a, a difficulty for that to happen right now because the Dome of the Rock, where most people understand the tabernacle used to be, has been overtaken by a Muslim mosque. And so in order to build a temple there, they would have to tear down the mosque which would, of course, anger a lot of Muslim people. Uh, they claim rights to that area. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, the bottom line is, the, uh, from what I understand, anyway, from what the Bible is saying here, is that the, the, there was instruction given for this temple. It was if they repented and they didn't repent, and also, um, after Christ died, there's no more a need for an earthly sanctuary anyway. Right. Jesus is in heaven. Yes. In the sanctuary. Okay. 
so anyway, there is no need for earthly an earthly sanctuary to continue today. So are they not um, recognizing that? Well, any any Jew that would take in uh, plan to go and rebuild the temple, they would uh, probably not take into account the fact that Christ actually already came 2,000 years ago almost. And right. told, he told the children of Israel that the house was left empty. And we're also told by Paul that the commandment was changed. Um, that whole system was is ended. So you would have to ignore that to go and rebuild the temple. Right. Well, they okay. They just didn't, they don't. They're still waiting for Messiah. They didn't believe that Jesus was um, who he said he was. And right. He so, so if the Messiah hasn't come yet you know, in their mind. Um, and the okay. whole carrying on of the sanctuary services still needs to happen. That's right, okay. Because Jesus didn't die yet, in their mind. Jesus yes. didn't die. Yes, of course. So, so you can but, understand. Okay, their, that's... Their they do have to ignore a lot of uh, of scripture, and not, not just Isaiah 53, right? Correct. That's, that's like the famous one. I don't know. But, yeah. okay, so they have to, yeah, so how can they do that? I don't understand. I guess um, I, just I like understand. any other religion, you know, they have their different way of thinking. Right. To get their traditions going on. Exactly. And their own doctrine. Okay. All right. So that explains it, kind of. <laughs> well, here I'm is I'm not one of them. Exactly. I want to know the truth. Yes, amen. So let's know the truth. Anyway, there's so there's a bunch of rules about what the priests do, and they're they're called these the statutes. There's a statute for a whole bunch of statutes for the priests, what they're to do, um, how they're to dress what they're to do with the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. It does say that they were to be forever. All right, so we... And all of those... Go ahead. All of those things are pointing to Jesus. All those um, the things that were in this in the sanctuary and all the things that the priests are doing with their uh, vestments and whatnot. It all has to do with what Jesus came and fulfilled. Right. Okay. Anyway, you see that term ordinance forever or perpetual ordinance. Uh, most of these are referring to the Levites and what they're to do with the offerings. Uh, I'm just going through um, fairly quickly. There are statutes here in Numbers. There's statutes relating to um, people as well, or common people. Anyway, does that answer your question, Lonnie? On statutes? Yeah, that answers our question pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't really get into judgments. We didn't do uh, a search on judgments, but we could do that too, if you like. It just really helps. That really helped what you went over tonight. Mm -hmm. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, here is the, the judgment. So the first place you see it is Genesis 18, 19. For I know him, talking about Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now, we read the definition of the word judgment, mish, mishvat. It means judgment, justice, ordinance, act of deciding a case, a court, seat of judgment, a 
process, procedure, a case, a sentence. So it, it's a judicial type thing. That's mentioned in Genesis 18 a couple of times. Uh, and Genesis 40 also. And then we find it first time in Exodus is in Exodus 15, 23. And it's called ordinance, interestingly. Genesis 15, 25 says, He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Now, the ordinance there is judgment. So actually, okay. it's the statute, I believe we looked at that earlier, is the other word. Um, yeah, the, the Coke statute. Anyway, so that's a statute or judgment. These are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. So in Exodus 21, you have judgments. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out for nothing. Okay, that's an interesting judgment. Do you think that applies to our time? No. I mean, I guess if you're going to buy slaves, but <laughs> I wouldn't. I, I don't think that's one. A, what's that? Oh, no. I said I can't afford one. I wouldn't <laughs> want a slave. No. Because servants are voluntary. They're voluntary, but they're bought in this case, right? Or they're paid. Or because I thought there was a statute against stealing a man and forcing him to labor. Okay. Can't remember if it was in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Because the servant agrees to go in a seven-year term for service, and then he decides whether he stays for life or moves on. Right. But in the seventh year, it says he shall go out free for nothing. Yeah. And then if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he, This is the place where it talks about that. If he married, yeah. then his wife shall go out with him. If he were married when he came in, then he, his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife and she has borne him sons and poor daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself. Well, that's kind of brutal. But if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. His master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. There's that word forever again. Does that mean without end? Probably means for life. For life, yeah. As long, as long as he lives. So forever means as long as that situation applies or it can have an end. But he says he doesn't want to go out free, which is chuff, chuff shy, free liberty, free, free from slavery, free from taxes or obligations. So it would end, indicate that he was, if he's not going to go out free, then he's not free anymore. He's staying with his wife and children. <laughs> anyway, I think slavery is a terrible thing. If that's what it's talking about, if it's talking about voluntary servanthood, um, you know, maybe the person was in debt, like happened with Pharaoh and Joseph. They had to yield up their land because they needed food to eat. 
and so they sold they sold everything they had and then finally all, the only thing they had left is their land and he, they sold him the land um, anyway so they were almost certain i guess servants of pharaoh by that time Okay, so now here's a judgment. Um, it says whether this is talking about a uh, animal. If you have a, a an animal who is wild and mischievous and dangerous to other people, if you don't control that animal, it's your fault if that animal kills somebody. So here it says... If an ox gore a man, this is found in Exodus 21, 28. Exodus 21, 28. Anybody want to read that? We'll read a few verses here. I'll take it. Okay. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall surely be stoned. And his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. Okay. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Okay, so that indicates there's a there's a way out. Uh, well, verse 31, you can go with that, because that uses the word judgment, if you want to read that too. Yeah. Whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. Uh, and then look at verse 32. It's uh, it's the servant's way, uh, price. Anybody uh, read 31 or 32 also? If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give it unto their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Remember how much Jesus was sold for? Do you remember what Judas That's was paid? 30, piece, 30 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that was the price of a manservant or a maidservant. Anyway, and then it talks about a if a man shall open a pit or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good and give money unto the owner of him, of them, and the dead beast shall be his. Anyway, so there's a bunch of rules here. These are called judgments. So, Lonnie, you were asking about the statutes and the judgments. We looked at statutes a fair amount, and now we're looking at judgments. This is a judgment. Okay. So it's like a court case. This is this is the way you follow, you you deal with this situation. This is a judgment that a judge would give. So, anyway, back to Deuteronomy chapter five. Does that does that help answer the question? I don't think we have to look at every single one, but yeah, I think we, I think we got enough information to make a fair understanding of what the statutes and judgments are. Uh-huh. There are other judgments, like I remember one that if you borrow somebody's tools and then you break it while you're using it, you're not allowed to return it broken. And that I understand would be a judgment as well. Uh-huh. You instead of returning it broken, you would either fix it or replace it or something like that. Kind of like, remember the story of the the man that was um, cutting down a tree with an ax that was borrowed and the ax head flew off and went into the, the river and he got upset about it. And he came to Elisha and said, uh, 
they told him what happened that the axe had fell off in the river and he says alas for it was borrowed uh, anyway because it was borrowed it had to be dealt with properly if it was his own axe you know he could deal with the loss but if it's somebody else's axe that's not okay. So this is, it's in 2 Kings 6, verse 5. Yeah, he had to get it back to the owner. Right. So that was a rule that was in place, a judgment. And anyway, I think these judgments still make sense to this day, right? If you have a wild animal, if your dog is vicious and bit somebody and gave him rabies, well, I don't know. If he gave him rabies, then he'd have to have rabies to start with. But if he attacked somebody and maybe killed somebody, then he, it's your responsibility to do something with that uh -huh. animal. Uh huh. If you just let it go and you know let it run out of your fence, not keep him in, like it says about the ox. Um, if he hurts somebody else, it's your fault. In fact, there was even a death penalty attached to that. Your animal kills somebody. He, it's it's as if you killed him. And since you let your animal do it on purpose, with your knowledge and without stopping them, then it's your fault and it's considered murder. Anyway, so some of those judgments, I believe to be moral, uh, moral rules that are still applicable because they're just explain explaining the Ten Commandments. But as far as statutes and judgments that deal with a sanctuary or sin, I should say, to be more precise. See, what happened is in the, in the beginning, there was just a simple moral law, which is love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Obey God, and love him with all your heart. And that's the, the basis of the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with loving God and the second, the last six commandments deal with loving your neighbor. And the, that was a moral law that was existent before sin entered the world. It was just uh, the moral law existed forever. Even the Sabbath, which is part of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, it existed before sin. But after sin entered the world, then there entered a new type of law. It was, called a ceremonial law, uh, a law of types and shadows that were pointing to the coming of Christ. And that moral law at first was very simple. It was killing an animal. You didn't have to go to a sanctuary. You didn't have to go to a priest. Um, remember Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's first uh, children? Cain and Abel, they offered sacrifices. They didn't go to a sanctuary to do it. They didn't go to a priest. They just did it themselves. And that's the way it was done at the beginning. For the first couple thousand years, that's the way um, the, uh, the ceremonial law was carried out. It was just kill an animal. Now, in Abraham's time, and, and you built a sanctuary or built an altar yourself. The men would, I, I believe it was done by the men primarily anyway. Maybe kids would help or some other family members would help. I'm not really sure. But anyway, the, the men were the priests of their home, and they would build an altar and then offer a sacrifice uh, for sins. If they committed sin, they'd, they'd offer a sacrifice. And then later in Abraham's time, there was, which is approximately 2,000 years after creation of the world, so approximately 2,000 years from Cain and Abel's time, so for the first 2,000 years, that's all that was, a simple animal sacrifice. No sanctuary, no feast days, no anything else, just, just a uh, animal sacrifice for sin. And then when Abraham's time came along, there was something else added. Do you remember what that was? What was added when Abraham came along? That's I'm called. thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. It wasn't the priesthood. No. No, they have they hadn't added that yet. Oh, circumcision. Exactly. You put it up on there and I cheated. <laughs> huh? 
Yes, it was circumcision. That is what was yeah. added. Uh huh. He says, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And so that's what happened from Abraham's time on, for the children of Israel at least, they were had to also circumcise their children, their men, man child. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so circumcision was added around Abraham's time. And then there was uh, over 400 years, 500 years before Moses came on the scene. What was added in Moses's time to the ceremonial services, I should say. There's a long list if you had to write a list, but the sanctuary was one of them. Yeah, and the priesthood, right? And, and the Levitical priesthood, that was all started with Aaron, Moses' brother. Um, and then Aaron and his seed, his children, were Levites. And they were um, they were the priest, priesthood, Levitical priesthood. And then there was the san sanctuary services. That was brand new. And anybody before that? For the first 2,500 years, they never went to any uh, sanctuary. Correct? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the... Yeah, because there was no sanctuary. Right. There was no sanctuary until Moses' time, which is approximately 2,500 years after creation. And about 1,500 years before Jesus came on the scene. So anyway, around Abraham, or Moses' time is when a lot of laws were added. And now when those laws were added, there were laws about, for example, a man or lying down to a beast. That was not allowed, right? Moses made that clear. You, you don't do that. Um, also, homosexuality was forbidden. That was all explained by Moses' law. Now, keep in mind, those those uh, restrictions were already there, so to speak, just not written. Right. In other words, they already knew that was wrong and they, they weren't doing that. Just like before the Ten Commandments were written or spoken, um, Joseph knew that it was a sin to commit adultery. And when Potiphar's wife tried to commit adultery with him, he said, no, how can I do this sin against God? He knew that was a sin. And also stealing uh, was mentioned as a sin. Prior to that, there's several other things that made it clear that the basics of the Ten Commandments were understood by them, even though they didn't they did not have clear, detailed instruction. And the reason why I believe the instruction came through Moses is the corruption that was coming in to the worship, uh, godly worship. See, at the beginning in Adam and Eve's time, it was very simple. There was not um, Paganism wasn't even a thing. They didn't, you know, so it was a very simple uh, ceremonial service, ceremonial law. It was a very simple, simple instructions. But what happened is corruption started to come in over the years. Like when Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, he came out of a pagan nation. Ur of the Chaldees was a pagan nation. I know some people think Hebrew is such a special language. Uh, but that was a language of pagan people. You know, a lot of pagan worshipers used the Hebrew language to describe their gods. Uh, Baal was one of those false gods. Uh, it was called Elohim as well. But regardless, um, Abraham and Abraham's time, because of the paganism that was creeping in. And we know that paganism was still involved because remember when... Um, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, when Jacob left uh, the land, uh, his uncle, what was his name again? Um, I don't know why I can't remember his name. Laban. Is that right? Anyway, just, or Jacob married two sisters, uh, Leah and Rachel. Anyway, when they were leaving, when they left Laban, they had to kind of leave secretly, and Laban got upset and chased him. And when when he came and tracked him down, do you remember what he was looking for? Does he was he was looking for his their um, his gods. 
you know, as pagan gods. And yeah. I guess Rachel was sitting on them. <laughs> yeah, so you, you remember the story. Yeah. So that shows that paganism was actually already happening in um, in Jacob's time. Because his his wife had stolen an idol from his dad, her dad, and she was sitting on it. Uh, I, I'm trying to find that, but I looked up the word God, which is going to uh, going to bring up too many verses. But maybe maybe it'll be with a small G, then it can make it easier to find. Ah, there it is. You stole in my gods. <laughs> can you believe it? You can steal gods? Wow. They're not gods then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. They can't protect themselves. They need to be born about. Anyway, so this is the story. It's in Genesis 31. Uh, Genesis 31 verse 30 is where Laban accuses Jacob of stealing his gods. You've stolen my gods. And then Jacob says to Laban, with whomsoever you find thy gods, let him not live. Um, but then it says, Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Um, anyway, you know Why the story. Why did she steal them anyway? I forgot. Well, I mean, I would say that she was still involved in paganism to some degree, right? So it says Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. You know what the custom of women is? She yeah, said she, she was probably having her period. <laughs> right. right. So she used that as an excuse. And then it says, Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff that thou hast, uh, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren that they may judge between us. Because he was accused of being a robber. And now he's saying, look, I didn't, I didn't rob anything. Did you find anything that I robbed? Show it. Anyway, which, in fact, Rachel had robbed and stole the gods. Um, but it just shows that paganism was creeping into the worship of God. Even among God's people, right? Jacob's, uh, Abraham's own granddaughter, Jacob's wife, who... Uh, was chosen by God, I believe, for him, but still she was involved in, in idolatry. So things needed to be more clear to distinguish godly worship from idolatrous worship. And that's why circumcision was added to set God's people apart. That's what made them different. And you see that throughout the, the journeyings of the Israelites. They were very different from everybody else because they were circumcised and they would talk about other nations that they're uncircumcised you know we we can't um for example they couldn't marry their daughters could not marry men that were uncircumcised so there was a time when a nation agreed to have their whole family circumcised so that they could marry the daughters of abraham as offspring jacob anyway Circumcision was added through Abraham to give them more distinction as a separate uh, type of worship. But then still more paganism came in. They got taken to Egypt 
and there was a lot of paganism involved in Egypt, of course. I mean, you can still see it to this day, the remnants of it. You go to Egypt today, you, you, you know, they were idolatrous nation. They worshiped Ra, the sun god. I think that's the name of the Egyptian sun god. Anyway, um, so they learned more idolatry when they were in Egypt. And so when they came out of Egypt, Moses uh, through Moses, God established more instruction to make them even more unique. That's when he started the sacrificial system. I mean, the sacrificial system was already there, but he started the sanctuary services and the Levitical priesthood. That was all established, brand new, made them very distinct and different from the nations. It made God's people more unique. And we saw that in Deuteronomy chapter four, I think it was, that was so abundantly clear. Maybe it was chapter three as well, that God God brought out these people to be different. He wanted to make sure that they didn't become like all the other nations. And so this was the, the gradual progression of the sacrificial or sacrificial system of the ceremonial laws, as they got more detailed as time went on, because paganism crept in more and more. Anyway, there's a really good book that explains all of what I just said pretty much in uh, great detail. And it's a book called Patriarchs and Prophets. And the chapter is The Law and the Covenants. Chapter 32 of that book, it's really well written. And it explains these different laws that were added. So through Moses' time, there were laws added that defined the Ten Commandments. So those are moral laws. And then there were laws added that defined and, and uh, distinguished the ceremonial services. This ceremonial law was added to as well. And so the way you distinguish these two laws is, did they exist before sin? Or were they added to deal with sin? That's how you know whether a law is ceremonial or moral. Does that law relate to how sin is dealt with? For example, the laws we just read of the Levites, what they did with the wave sheaf or the way the heave offering and the wave offering, and um, how they were supposed to dress as priests and things they were supposed to do in the sanctuary. Can you tell what kind of a law those were? Were, were those moral laws or ceremonial laws? Any input? There are ceremonial laws that they have to do with the. Yes, any laws that dealt with sin in any way dealing with sin, because that's what the ceremonial law is about, is how sin is dealt with. Any laws that were dealing with sin were added after sin came into the world. And at first they were simple, as I was just explaining, and they got more and more detailed. But when you look at the law of Moses, just ask yourself, is this a moral law or a ceremonial law? Does this law relate to sin and the deal, God's dealing with sin? Or does this law relate to how you treat people, how you love God with all your heart and how you love your neighbor as yourself? And that's all you have to ask in the, in the Moses' law. So, for example, the law about borrowing somebody's tool and then ruining it, breaking it, and the law that says, you're supposed to bring that tool, either replace it or fix it. Is that a moral law or a ceremonial law? Is that a law that deals with how God deals with sin? Or is that a law that uh, explains how to keep the moral law? Moral law. Moral law, right? It's, a, it's the law of thou shall not steal. If you break somebody's stuff and you return it broken, you've stolen from that person correct? Yes. So that is just a law explaining uh, the moral law, the Ten Commandments. So it's uh -huh. certainly that type of a law is a moral law, and you can expect that would still be enforced. You know, still to this day, just because Jesus mm -hmm. died on the cross doesn't mean you can go and take your neighbor's stuff and break it, right? That's right. That's right. So, so Christ's death on the cross had nothing to do with the way you deal with your neighbor in borrowing things from him. 
Um, same with like Moses's law makes it very clear: you, a man or a woman, does not lay down to an animal. Is that a moral law or a ceremonial? Law? It's a moral law. A moral law. It deals with thou shalt not commit adultery, right? So it's really simple, actually, to determine whether this particular Mosaic law is still enforced today. Just look at it and ask yourself, is this a law that relates to sin and God's dealing with sin? If so, it's it's been done away with at the cross. You know, the law, there were laws that were nailed to the cross. We read that clearly in uh, both Ephesians and Colossians. There are shadows, shadows that were nailed to the cross. And we know that some of those shadows include Sabbaths. We know that from Colossians chapter 2. Because in Colossians chapter 2, it says that Christ uh, nailed to the cross handwriting of ordinances. The handwriting of ordinance that was against us, that's Colossians 2 verse 14, uh -huh. was nailed to the cross. And we know that deals with Sabbaths or appointed times and feast days. In fact, the holy day, the word holy day there is feast day. Um, we know that what was nailed to the cross included the feast days, appointed times that dealt with uh, feast day times. We know that was nailed to the cross because Paul lays it out very clearly and says, which are a shadow of things to come. So any laws that related to feast days or new moons or Sabbaths, because there were there were annual Sabbaths as well. This is not actually talking about the Ten Commandments Sabbaths. Um, and also meat and drink. Any of those laws that relate to that, that are shadows of things to come, those are things that deal with sin, and they have been nailed to the cross. Um, look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Would anybody like to read that? Ephesians 2, 15. You want me to read it? Sure. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace okay so the law of commandments contained in ordinances you, you know if you search for this word ordinance mm -hmm. oops ordinance um watch the first time you find it in the bible is exodus 12 we referred to exodus 12 before First time uh -huh. you find it was Exodus 12, verse 14, verse 17, verse 24, and verse 43. And what that says is it's the ordinance of the Passover. That is to be an ordinance forever, a feast ordinance forever. We already saw ordinances forever don't mean that it doesn't have an end. Um, mm -hmm. Also. Part of this ordinance that was forever says, uh, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every manservant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one, uh, and verse 48, it says, when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So anyway, that's a... And keep the Passover. Yes, you can't keep the Passover unless you're circumcised. So if circumcision uh -huh. goes away, if circumcision goes away, which we see really clearly in the New Testament that it is, um, obviously any other laws relating to it would go away with it too you can't keep the Passover if you're not circumcised anyway that, that shows the link between them and if you look at the Passover what was it about why did it start just read Exodus 12 it tells all about it where it came from the, the only reason there was ever a Passover 
Go ahead. Deliverance from Egypt. It, it was the deliverance. Yeah, deliverance from Egypt. They had to slay a lamb. Correct. They had to kill an animal and they had to take the blood and put it on the doorpost. And then they had to eat the animal. They had to eat the lamb, and if anything was left over, they weren't allowed to let it stay till uh, till morning. They had to burn it with fire before morning came up. Um, that was the law of circumcision. Of, sorry, of, of the Passover, and then you also had to be circumcised. There's even more rules to it. You had to do it in Jerusalem. Uh huh. You couldn't just do it anywhere. You had to do it in Jerusalem. Anyway, that's why I want to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So just ask yourself, was the Passover related to sin and dealing with sin? Uh, yes. So, yeah, if the answer is yes, then the Passover ended at the cross. There's just no other question to ask. Pretty simple to answer the, the questions. If there was no sin, mm -hmm. there would never have been a Passover. Right? If sin didn't come into the world, Passover right. never That's right. Uh-huh. So for somebody to say, well, we need to still keep the Passover because it says it was an ordinance forever. Well, yes, it does say that. But it says the priest also um, it was an ordinance forever to do what the priest did. And yet that forever didn't mean without end. So who's to, how can you assume that when it's talking about the Passover, it's without end. And I, I just think it's plain to just ask yourself that question. Does it relate to sin? And if it if it is related to sin and the dealing, God's dealing with sin, how to remove sin from us, like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I believe, does deal with sin, how removing sin from your life. But the, all the symbolism that is brought out in the Feast, of Passover and unleavened bread, it can only make any sense if sin exists. If sin didn't exist, if sin had never come into the world, nobody would be keeping the Passover. Does that make sense? Same with the sanctuary and the Levitical priesthood. None of that would exist without sin. It was all added because of sin. And mm -hmm. therefore, what about the Feast of Tabernacles? That was also added because of sin. That wouldn't exist without sin either. I oh. believe that ended at the cross as well. There, every every shadowy type. If you look at the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, which interestingly, most I haven't met a person, not even a Jew, who actually keeps the Passover the way the Bible says you're supposed to do it. Not the Passover, the uh, the uh, Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. I've never met anybody that does what it says, because it says very clearly, here, I'll find the verse, um, palm branches. Uh, and it mentions the brook as well. Let's see that. Okay, here it oh, is. Oh, the Palm Sunday? Uh, well, Palm Sunday seems a little odd because... This had to have, well, no, it could have been Sunday, but it had to happen on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the 15th day of the month. And if you're familiar with the 15th day of the month uh, for feast keeping, it is considered a Sabbath, or it's actually, to be more specific, it's a Sabbaton. It's not a Shabbat. It's not an actual Sabbath. It's a Sabbaton. And you'll see that distinction in, in Leviticus chapter 23. Um, this is Leviticus 23.40 that says um, what you're supposed to do on the Feast of on the or Feast of Tabernacles. Look what you're supposed to do on that day. Anyway, you I also have to look at the, um, the sacrifices that were done on that day. There's more sacrifices done on the Feast of Tabernacles than any other day of the year. That was the most sacrifices of all. Um, but anyway, what you're supposed to do is you shall take you on the first day, which is uh, considered a Sabbaton. It's actually in Leviticus 23. It's called Sabbath, translated Sabbath in English. But in Hebrew, it's not Shabbat. It's not the week. It's not the day that's Shabbat. Um, 
it's I'm trying to find where it uses the word Sabbath, the English word Sabbath, but in Hebrew, there it is, verse 39. So this says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath. Now, that's what it says in English there. But if you notice, it's not capitalized. Now, that is uh, significant. It is not the weekly Sabbath. In fact, it's a rest. It's only translated Sabbath three times. It was used 11 times. Most times it's just translated rest. And... Anyway, that is a sabbaton, and there is work allowed on that day. Certain types of work were allowed on the sabbaton days, including picking up sticks. Now, you remember what happens when somebody picked up sticks on the actual Sabbath day? They got stoned. They got stoned, yes. If you know your oh, wow. Bible, that's in Leviticus uh -huh. 16. In Leviticus 16, there's a man caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, he got stoned. But in this particular day, on the 15th day of the seventh month, there is the, the first day of that Feast of Tabernacles is called a, a Sabbath, but that's not Shabbat. That is Sabbaton. Uh, so if you look at the word, it's Shabbaton. You see that? Which is different than Shabbat. Um, Shabbat, you can't do any work, but Shabbaton, you can do certain types of work. And so there's no prohibition against this you could pick up sticks on the shabbaton days you just couldn't do it on the shabbat anyway then it says in verse 40 you shall take you on the first day the bows of goodly trees branches of palm trees and the bows of thick trees and willows of the brook and you shall rejoice before the lord your god seven days and in more detail it tells you that you build booths so you, you pick up those branches and then you build booths and you stay in those booths for seven days. That's why it's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Well, these booths were supposed to be made out of palm trees. Where do you get palm trees? Palm branches. Palm can you get them? Can you get them anywhere? No, you can, get them in, you can get them in California. You can get them in California. That's right. Can you get them in Idaho? Well, no, we don't have palm trees up here. <laughs> well, no, in, or in Oregon, we have Mexican fan palms. Oh, well. They live there, but not here. So oh, okay. Cold. Well, the reality is palm trees don't exist everywhere. There's a lot of places in the world that you it's not available anywhere, like where I live. We can't. Uh, I have seen some banana trees grown in places. It's not exactly a palm tree, but I don't see any palm trees around where I live. So if I'm going to keep this rule, don't you think I have to go somewhere else? I can't do it here. Okay. Well, you know, the Passover could only be done in Jerusalem. It says, uh, so let me find that rule. Um, where he says you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to kill the Passover in any of your dwellings. I guess it doesn't. I think it does say dwelling. So. Let's see if I could clean it that that. Anyway, it's in Deuteronomy. I can't remember the chapter. 16. And, uh, well, I guess it doesn't use the word dwellings. No, it's not there. Okay, so anyway. I'll just look up the word Passover. Should be able to find it. Uh, there it is, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 16. Look what it says in verse five. Anybody want to read five and six? Deuteronomy 16, verses five and six. Yeah, I could read it. Okay. Thou mayest 
not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, for the Lord thy God giveth thee, oh, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, where thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so notice he says you can't, you cannot sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates. I thought it was dwellings, but it's gates. Yeah. It says, but you have to go to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. Does anybody know where that is? Holy Jer of Holies? Jerusalem. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah Jerusalem, which is yeah. in the, I'm, Holy of Holies is in Jerusalem, right? Well, you, you know that the Israelites had a practice uh, three times a year. They the, All the, the males would come before the Lord, right? They would have to make a travel, a trip. Remember when Jesus was young, uh, 12 years old, his parents were going to Jerusalem. Why? Why, why would all these people sojourn to Jerusalem three times a year? Because <laughs> that's what God told them to do. Keep the feast, right? To keep the feast, right? Because they it says very plainly here, you can't do it in your own house. You can't do it in your own gates. Instead, you had to go somewhere else. You had to go to where God put his name. And you also had to be circumcised. So you had to go to Jerusalem, and you also had to be circumcised to keep the Passover. And the tabernacles was the same way. Just as the Passover, you had to journey to Jerusalem to keep it. You also had to journey to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Which made sense now that that's where palm trees are. So, it, I mean, it doesn't mean palm trees don't exist other places. They do. But just because palm trees exist there, you still are not allowed to keep the Passover there. You still have to go to Jerusalem. Anyway, God never intended the Passover to be a worldwide event. The Passover was specifically for the Israelites, and it was specifically for their city, Jerusalem. That is where you had to go to do it. Um, and, and you can see other things, too, because like the wave sheaf, you know, they weren't allowed to eat any of the food from their crops until they waved the sheaf on the day after the Sabbath and Passover. They had to wave the sheaf. It was the first fruits of their land, of their crops. They waved it before the Lord. And it says very clearly, they were not allowed to eat the, the fruit of their land until they did that. So their spring crops, they, they couldn't eat anything from it until they did that wave offering. Well, anyway, the, the wave offering had to be done on the 15th day of the first month. That is when they waved the sheaf, that, which is the, the barley, the barley harvest. It had to be ripe for them to wave it before the lord and that barley being ripe it um re restricted it to a particular location because at the time that the barley is ripe in jerusalem is different than the barley is ripe in france or israel or sorry idaho or oklahoma right the time if you plant barley it's not going to be ripe at the same time it is in jerusalem uh -uh. and that's that's actually how they figured all of their feast was based upon when the year started, and it started when the barley was ripe in Jerusalem. Uh huh. Which, there's there's quite a debate among feast keepers, and you probably know that yes, whether yes. Uh, you start the year by the barley harvest or or um, the vernal equinox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, the equinox yeah. can be done anywhere in the world, right? You can be in yeah. Alaska and calculate the equinox. Uh -huh. you can't do the barley harvest because you go to Alaska, you're not going to have barley ready at, at, at the springtime. <laughs> no. So, so anyway, the barley harvest, which dictates the timing, it also dictates the location. And the rule of not killing the Passover anywhere except for Jerusalem, and the rule that you had to be circumcised to do it, I believe all of those tie it intrinsically to jerusalem 
But not only that, I mean, you we don't even have to have this discussion because we've already decided and, and noticed that the Passover was dependent upon sin to exist. The Passover is a dealing with sin. It was something that was a shadow that was pointing toward Christ. And when Christ died, it was nailed to the cross, mm -hmm. according to Colossians chapter 2. And that, therefore, because of that, nobody's allowed to judge us regarding those things because they're shadows. And those shadows ended yeah. at the cross. They were nailed to and the that's cross. That's why they called it the Last Supper. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I think there's lots of things that point the Passover to or the, these feast days are all dealing with sin. If you didn't have sin, would you have a Day of Atonement, for example? No. No, the Day of Atonement completely is dealing with sin. I mean, there's no such thing as a Day of Atonement apart from sin. If you take sin out of the picture, you go back to the Garden of Eden, they're not going to do a Day of Atonement. It's just not going to happen. Because mm -hmm. it's dealing with sin. And the same is true with Passover. There would no, there would be no Israelites stuck in Egypt. There would be no need for a Passover and an angel coming over and killing the firstborn. It wouldn't have happened. Um, the tabernacles, that was what I understand tabernacles represents is a temporary dwelling in, in a another place, in booths. And you wouldn't have that without sin. It's uh -oh. also... I forgot about it. What's that? Oh, sorry, your microphone's falling. Well, anyway, I know it's getting late, so I don't want to belabor this too long, but hopefully we've found some more details that help us understand uh, the rules. If you look at statutes and judgments in the book of Moses, in the law of Moses, and you can determine, is this a law relating to sin that has anything to do with sin and how it's dealt with? then you automatically know that it ended at the cross. It's a shadow. If it's a shadow, it was imposed on them. It was for the time then present, and it was imposed on them until the time of Reformation. And what I believe Jesus did was he instituted the Last Supper as a replacement for, that's really the only ceremony that we have today, but it replaces all of the, the Jewish festivals. Uh, Feast of the Jews, you know, if you, you look up that term, you find it in the Bible. Feast of the Jews, but you'll never find Sabbath of the Jews because there's no such thing. It's the Sabbath of, of the Lord. Okay. You find that. But this was for the Jews. It was for Jerusalem. It was for the time then present. Once Jesus died and the veil of the temple was rent in twain, that whole system was over. I mean, sure, people can go and do the sacrifice or do the, um, yeah, they could do the sacrifice, which they did, but it was a, it, it was a moot point. It was unnecessary. It was no longer required. Well, Jesus already died. You don't need to keep doing the Passover. You don't need to keep doing the ceremonial services, the, the sanctuary services. It all ended at the cross. Anyway, I think it's really plain and easy to, to distinguish the difference between ceremonial laws and statutes and judgments. There's ceremonial ones, and then there are moral ones, and you can easily distinguish the two. Just ask that one question. Does it deal with sin? Does this have anything to do with how God deals with sin? If it does, it ended at the cross. E even but the, but the moral law is all the Ten Commandments, right? Yes, the moral law is the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. plus, you know, the the laws of Moses that deal with the moral law, like mm -hmm. the law that says thou shalt not steal. Well, Moses' law explains that you don't borrow somebody's tools and break them and return them broken. That is a explanation of the moral law that deals with thou shalt not steal. And so you can look at those moral laws in the in the books of uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy 
And you can see, okay, well, that law is still in force because just because Jesus died doesn't change the fact that I, I'm not allowed to steal my neighbor's tools. Right. Still not allowed to do that. But that kind of treatment of your neighbor would exist even without sin in the world. You still, you just wouldn't treat your neighbor that way. Common sense, like written on your heart. Right. And same with like your your animal. If you have an animal that kills your neighbor and it's your fault because you knew about it. Um, now, if it wasn't your fault, you didn't know about it, then, then it's not your fault. You're not held guilty although you might have to go to a city of refuge which was established for that purpose but um anyway i, I think it's plain as as clear as crystal to dis distinguish whether a law in any of the statutes and judgments or ordinances in the first five books of the bible if they're still in force just ask that one question does it deal with sin is this in any way explaining how God deals with sin. And if so, it's been nailed to the cross. If not, uh, well, anyway. All right, that all started with that one question in Deuteronomy 5.1. Go ahead. No, I was going to say we don't have to worry about it then. Because I always had like that question in my mind until I started, you know, getting on the Zoom calls last year. Mm -hmm. It was explained, but that that one church that sends the uh, Beyond uh, Today magazine, they they seem like they really have everything in all their ducks in a row, except they want to celebrate the um, the the all the feast days. Well, if they're going to do if they're going to yeah. do it according to the Bible, you know, what they, they'll say is, well, right. we, we do it at the time, and we do everything except for the sacrifices. Well, really? Right. If you're going to, if you're <laughs> going to keep, if you're going to get tabernacles, you got to go to Jerusalem and get some palm branches. Yes. So I, I don't I, know how, how extensively they, they, um, you know, they just, I don't know, they just, um, you know, they make it sound like it's important, but that's that's a strange thing that they have everything else right from what I've been able to gather, you know. Well, they I mean, that, make that a happens. big error. That, that happens. People do it. Now, you can think of a globe also, the fact that everything south of the equator has their seasons opposite of those north of the equator. So in December... Up north of the equator, like where I live, it could be snowing. There could be snow on the ground. In Idaho, there probably is snow on the ground in December, right? Or in Minnesota, there's snow on the ground. Well, you... Yeah, most of the time there's snow on the ground. We're kind of in a banana belt, so we don't have as much snow as other places in Idaho. <laughs> but, but if we traveled and just crossed the equator and went down to Australia, go down to southern Australia... Yeah, it's, it's hot down there. <laughs> yeah, but in December, it's hot. You're in the middle of summer down there. So what that means is all of the all of the spring feasts would actually be taking place in the fall. And all of the fall feasts would be taking place in the spring. In Australia, right? Anywhere south of the equator. So that includes South Africa. That includes South America. Um the the reality is if you can't eat your the crops of your ground until you wave the sheaf the barley harvest then what are you going to do in australia you can't actually keep that feast at the same time everyone's doing it in the in the northern northern hemisphere correct right it would it would be hard <laughs> That's why they like the equinox it, instead. It wouldn't just be hard. You wouldn't have food. You couldn't eat any food from your <laughs> land until you do that. And because uh -huh. I'm just saying what the feast people say is, oh, we just strip the feasts of the sacrifices. We do everything else. No, you don't. You can't. You can't do everything else everywhere in the world. It's not even possible. So 
like I'm saying in Australia, the rule the rule is you can't eat anything from your garden until you wave that sheaf, the spring sheaf. Now, prior to that, you could eat things from last year, right? You could can it, you could store it, yeah. you'd have stuff from your last crop. But in the springtime, in the Northern Hemisphere, where Israel is, you couldn't eat anything new from your garden until you wave the sheaf of the barley, the barley sheaf. The barley had to be ripe in Jerusalem. Uh -huh. Then go and eat your crops. You had to wave that sheaf. Well, if you're down in Australia, if you try to do it at the same time, it's it's in the fall there. You've already wasted your the whole year of crops. You couldn't eat anything for the whole year of, of your crops until you wave the sheaf. And then the, the sheaf isn't even ripe at that time because the barley is not, um, it's, a, it's a winter crop. So it's, it's, it's ready in the fall. I mean, sorry, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere's fall, it would be ready down in Australia. Uh -huh. So you couldn't even eat your crops. You couldn't, you couldn't function. At the anyway. time of the, um, when it was in place, the world was quite a bit smaller. I mean, God was just dealing with the area there. He was just in, dealing uh, with around that. Jerusalem. Yeah. That's why he, he kicked everybody out from that nation, that area, and he put his uh -huh. his people there. And he, he okay. safeguarded okay. that spot. And that is where you're supposed to do the feasts. Oh. And if you try to do them worldwide, you can't do that. It's hard. <laughs> well, you can't do it the way the Bible says. You can, make up, you can make up your own way of doing it. You can like come and bring fruit of the ground like Cain did of his sacrifice. You can do it that way, but it's not God's way. So uh -huh. you're not even right. obeying God. Aren't and, those sacrifices foreign to God? Oh, or you usually see the word strange. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, he's the one who told him to do it, I and mean, he was very specific about how to do it. No, that's what I'm saying. If he, if they do sacrifices their way, outside of oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, if you do it Cain's way, it's foreign and it won't be recognized. You can claim to be doing it, but you're not, and God's not going to recognize it. He's not going to see that as oh, you're you're now closer to God now because you're doing it wrong. That doesn't make sense. Plus, it was all about um, pointing to Jesus. And when his right. son died on the cross, it was, you know, totally liquidated. Yeah, I think, I believe that it's clear. You know, God, God um, linked those services to Jerusalem. It was, a, it was never designed to be a worldwide event. You're not supposed to do it everywhere in the world. You had to go to Jerusalem to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, that determined the timing, uh, determined with the barley harvest, it determined the uh, palm branches. Uh, you had to be circumcised and you had to be in Jerusalem. Those were all rules about the feasts. And if you're not going to keep those rules, how can you claim that you're keeping the feasts? I, okay. I just I, I just think that it is it's not happening. All the people who claim to be keeping the feast, they're not, unless they're in Jerusalem, unless they're doing it the way God says to do it. Uh, if they're not right. there doing it that way, they're not actually doing it. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Well, and even well those people, it's, it's not right. Even if they're doing it now, it's not right. Exactly. Just like it was. Yeah. Okay. Just like the Israelites, okay. when when they repaired the, the veil of the temple that was written twain at Christ's death. They repaired it and just kept on carrying on with their services, morning and evening sacrifices and so on. They kept doing all the, the sanctuary services. That wasn't right. Yeah. They shouldn't have been doing that. It was it ended at the cross. Yeah. It was a supernatural event and they went ahead and just sewed it up. It was like such an insult. Right. Exactly. So anyway, I I just think it's really plain in the Bible that God planned those things to be temporary. Mm -hmm. Planned those things to only be done in Jerusalem, and it was for the time then present. So, I mean, people can pretend to do it elsewhere, but they're not. Like I said before, I've never met anybody that that does the Feast of Tabernacles the way the Bible says to do it. Even if you cut out sacrifices, they still don't do it that way. I've never seen anybody do it. I even met a Jew. I know a Jew who did it, 
he, he supposedly kept the Feast of Tabernacles, but the way he did it was he just used some pine wood from Lowe's and he built a little uh, a little building in his backyard and that was his Feast of Tabernacles hut that he lived in for seven days. So at least, you know, he's, but today a lot of people just, they, they go get a tent and they live in a tent or they go and they, um, they go to a hotel and they think that's keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. No, it isn't. The Bible told oh, you wow. how to do it. Anyway. All right. Sorry, I'm getting on this rant, but <laughs> it's just it's so nice we don't have to worry about it because it's awfully complicated, and, you know. Yeah, it is complicated. It's crazy, we couldn't do it if we wanted to. Yeah, you couldn't do it the way God said to do it unless you went to Jerusalem. All right. Okay. Yeah, we know people that believe it's a salvational issue if you don't keep the fees. Well, then, and, I, I mean, I, I guess Cain probably thought it was salvational for him to go offer the fruit of the ground, too, right. but it didn't do him any good. Uh, yeah. So you can think it's salvational, but you can you can see from the Bible that it was it was for a time then present and it was for uh -huh. and it was for circumcised people. That, um more people could use a good teacher like like you are, Brother Linford, because you explain it and it makes sense completely. You know, just like you said, it's not that difficult, but it is kind of uh, complicated. I mean, I couldn't do it by myself, figure it out. You know, like I'd be like, oh, I'd, right. I'd, I'd see the, the parts that say forever. And, you know, I, that's why I had a question. It was like, mm -hmm. but... I didn't worry about it too much since I wasn't Jewish or anything. And when people call today the Jewish uh, Sabbath, you can correct them and say it's the Sabbath of the Lord. And that could open up the discussion of the, the true Sabbath. Right, because like, like I pointed Sabbath. out, if, if you search for a feast of the Jews, we find it um, we find it two places, John 5, 1 and John 6, 4. But if you try to find Sabbath of the Jews, you don't find that anywhere. Okay. Instead, you find Sabbath of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, I, For all some, mankind. Yep. some people tell me Sabbath of the Lord is found four times or three times. It's in Exodus 20, verse 10. It's in Leviticus 23, 3. And it's Deuteronomy 5, 14. Now, um, he calls it my holy day in Isaiah 58, 13. Um, but anyway, you will never find the, the Sabbath of the Jews because there's no such thing. Right. The Sabbath of God right. that the Jews kept. I, I guess if, it, it, if uh, there was any type of Sabbath of the Jews, it would be the feast day Sabbaths or Sabaton, to be more precise, as we were looking right. at. Right. Earlier. There's feast day. Resting. God himself, he even said he gave his Sabbath to the Jews, but it was still his. Isn't there something about that? He gave it to yes. them. Because I gave they were them peculiar my, people. Yeah, he says, I gave them my Sabbaths. Mm -hmm. uh, let me find my that. Sab my Sabbath, yeah. Called it his it, again. Yeah, here it says, Thou shalt. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. So that's okay. Exodus 31, 13. And then um, trying to find where it says, I gave them my Sabbaths. You shall keep my Sabbaths. It's Leviticus 19 and also 26. And then Isaiah 56, thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. Oh, here it is. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a mm -hmm. sign between me and them. That's Ezekiel 20, verse 12. That's right. So, yeah. And as spiritual Jews, we've already also been given it. All people are supposed to keep it, but all people yeah. don't. Correct. 
Yeah, so my Sabbath is found actually a lot in Ezekiel. A bunch of times he talks about my Sabbath. How they rebelled and polluted him. All right, well, uh, hopefully that was helpful to get a little more detail on what statutes and judgments are, are, um, which ones are. Yeah, Ronnie said yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So it shouldn't, shouldn't be hard to distinguish whether these are rules that exist forever. You know, are they going to exist in the new earth? That's another question to ask. No, they, only the Sabbath and the new moon, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, for proof of that, Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, was it 23? Um, no, it's not 65, 66, sorry. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, and that Sabbath there, I am certain, is Shabbat. I'm just going to check it out, though. Yep, it's Shabbat, 7676. Uh, 7677 is Shabbaton, and 7676 is Shabbat. So from one Sabbath to another, so that's one seventh-day Sabbath, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So these are the appointed times in the new earth. The only appointed times that will exist then are the Sabbaths, weekly Sabbath, and the new moon. And I understand the reason for the new moon is that's when we get the new fruit that the tree of life produces. Um, Twelve manner of fruit every year. Uh, every month it has new fruit. And so every new moon we're going to, which new moon and new month are the same thing. Every new month we go to Jerusalem, to the new Jerusalem, and we eat the tree of life. And then every Sabbath, we get together, all flesh, I like that, all flesh shall come and worship. So you, you think you've been to a big camp meeting, you're not going to, you haven't seen anything yet. All right. the biggest camp meeting you've ever seen. It's going to happen every week. All with glorified bodies. Yes. We're all going to come. It'll make it the... easier to get there. That's Don't true. You just think of where you want to be and you get to go there. Something like that. Yeah, I don't I don't know the exact way of travel, but <laughs> I don't um, know either. But I do find this verse very, very um compelling because there's a lot of verses that mention the new moon, the Sabbath, and the feast days. And here is the only verse in the whole Bible that talks about appointed times in the new earth, and it leaves off feast days. It tells us there's going to be new moon and Sabbath, but there's not going to be feast days. We're not going to come on the Feast of Tabernacles. We're not going to come on a Day of Atonement. We don't need those things because there's no sanctuary. There's no animal sacrifices. There's no dealing with sin. It's all finished. So anyway, I find that verse very compelling. It's Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. All right, well, that's the end of my rant on feast days and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1. We only really got through one verse today, but that's okay. Thank you for that review. I really like that. Uh, you're welcome. Thank the Lord. Praise God. So Thank I don't know. Even... Amen. I don't know if there's anything else in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that we really need to go over. There might be. We might have to read it again next time, but uh, we, were, we already went over the Ten Commandments. Uh, we went over the distinction of the ceremonial law and the moral law. And then what else is there in the chapter? Um, there's not a whole lot of this chapter. Starting in verse 23 is when it Picks up after the Ten Commandments. Anyway, just going over Exodus 20, really. 
and how amazing it is that God spoke to them his own mouth no other nation was like that mm. anyway so I don't know if you guys want to keep going over Deuteronomy chapter 5 or we could just skip on to chapter 6 next time maybe chapter 6 is fine with me yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. we're, we we slowed down a little mm -hmm. bit on this chapter, but hopefully it's been beneficial. Yeah. And, and, and again, I don't ask anybody to believe what I, my views on it. I would just say examine it yourself. Um, but I wouldn't overlook any of the facts that I pointed out, Bible yeah. verses. That sounds good, yeah. Just... Mm -hmm. good. all right well we can go ahead and wrap up i know it's late um are there any comments or questions before we close all right well let's go ahead and have prayer then um could i get a volunteer to pray for us anybody like to do that for us By the way, I can put all these notes in your chat if you wanted to get them there. There, you can go to your chat and pull those notes out if you want. All right, we can go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. I'll pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we come to you and thank you so much for your goodness and love. We thank you for sending your own son to die for our sins. Thank you for all the things you've done on this this earth, the way that you plan things out ahead of time and uh, given us everything that we need to thrive and be a blessing in this world. We do not want to be like Cain and just offer sacrifices according to our own standards or own will. We want to order our lives according to your will and your plan for us. So Please guide us and direct us in all the ways that we should go. And if we diverge from to the right or to the left, Lord, we want to hear that word behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. We want to understand plainly what your will is, what your plan is for us, and how we can be an encouragement and a blessing to others. So we commit ourselves to you and we thank you for everything you do. Um, please forgive us where we failed you and, and uh, live in us so that your life, the life of Jesus Christ will be manifest in this mortal flesh. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 Man, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. So here goes.